When I talk about fintech, which scenario do you think is more relevant? Number one or number two? Probably most of you would go for number one. Okay, here's the answer. In scenario number one, these very cool machines with blue fluorescence are actually lined up robots to deliver dishes in a hot pot restaurant in Beijing. But in scenario number two, the woman beside this shoesmith, Yang Shifu, told me her last name is Xu, and I call her Xiao Xu. Xiao Xu works for one of the digital payment companies in China. On the day that I took this picture at a wet market in Shanghai, Xiao Xu was training the small merchants how to use a new QR code to collect payment from the customers. In this particular market street, which is about 80 meters long, there are around 200 merchants. Xiao Xu and her colleagues, together with the 200 small and micro business owners, are making FinTech happen. I call these people and the new lifestyle they enabled the human side of FinTech. I am Jing Wang, a professor in interactive media and the business at NYU Shanghai. I study the social and the cultural aspects of FinTech. To me, the human behaviors and their understandings of financial technology are way more intriguing than the machines and algorithms involved. In my research, I study how the ordinary people like Xiao Xu and Yang Shifu interact with financial technologies and with what kind of social and cultural consequences. In winter 2013, I was in graduate school and I needed to choose a dissertation topic. My background is in communication studies. At that time, social media was really a hot topic in my field. And in the Chinese context, of course, everyone was looking at Weibo and WeChat. I was also attracted by WeChat, but not by its amazing function as an online messenger. Rather, I was mesmerized by what it had enabled on the Chinese New Year Eve of 2014. I believe all of you know the Spring Festival Gala. It is a yearly extravaganza that has been screened on TV for 39 years, 8 p.m. to midnight on the New Year Eve. It's a media event in which the gala audience enjoy the synchronized viewership, like watching the Super Bowl in the US. It is also a ritual that allows the Chinese people overseas to get a sense of belonging. My husband and I moved to Canada in 2007 for work relocation, and we moved to the US in 2011 for graduate schools. During those years, watching the gala at the same time as our families in China was a form of unity, despite of the distance. While watching the gala of 2014 in New York, I saw my friends in China were posting on WeChat about their red packet. Sending out the red packet to families and friends became part of the ritual that night. It was reported that on the gala night, every minute about 25,000 WeChat red packet were taken and opened. Also, from Lunar New Year's Day to the seventh day of the New Year, more than 8 million WeChat users joined the sending red packet, red packet game. Red packet is part of the New Year tradition in China. Sending out red packet became an easier thing to do if you bond your bank account with WeChat wallet. And if you want to receive money from WeChat packet, you need to bond your bank account with WeChat and it became the users of WeChat Pay. In this sense, WeChat is a social media, but also a mediated network that makes WeChat Pay a payment portal. It is WeChat's engagement with the users, the understanding of the cultures of money in Chinese society that enabled the rise of payment technology in China. 
WeChat Red Packet adapted to the money culture in China, but also constitutes a new form of money culture in the digital age. Grabbing Red Packet became a fashion among people of all ages. I sent out a packet in my fintech class group. Every student took a grab, and nothing left in the blink of eyes. It's not only about how fast you are. Getting a share from this game is also a symbol of your luck. The professor sent out the packet for fun and for the students' engagement with this group, and for many other red packet issuers, they consider sharing as a key ethic in Chinese fortune culture, and the red packet makes it so handy and convenient on WeChat. These fascinating money practices get popularized. Via WeChat, the social media, and this is how a communication scholar settled on fintech research. But at that time, these technologies were called internet finance. As a junior researcher, I tried all my best to connect this interesting phenomena with literature. I ran into a problem. In year 2014. I couldn't find anything in the library search using the keyword of internet finance. I started to navigate in the darkness. But very soon, the international investment companies saw the potential of the Chinese market, and they introduced the idea of fintech to China along with the investment capital. Then. There was a debate between whether financial applications of digital technology should be called financial technology or technological finance. I observed this debate and found that the terminology of fintech is not only about its essence. The coinage of fintech in the Chinese context is more about who tries to promote the technology and how. Although internet finance essentially is finance, for example, WeChat Red Packet essentially is a typical financial service called payment clearance and settlement. However, calling it tech fin would make financial technology subject to financial regulation, which is the most conservative and strict sector in China's regulatory regime. But under the hat of fintech. The emerging industries would be considered as tech companies. They would undoubtedly get more space to grow. Not to mention, China was still quite pro-tech around the year 2014. From then on, fintech companies in China embarked on a rocket rise, authorized by the regulators and driven by the innovators. The fintech users and innovators. Brought me lots of interesting cases for my research. I couldn't wait to go back to China for my dissertation fieldwork. In 2017 and 2018, I spent almost a year in Shanghai, Hangzhou, and Beijing. I was amazed by the varieties of business innovation enabled by fintech. Payment technology was almost everywhere. It saved labor cost, make transactions faster and easier. However, fintech is also applied beyond the payment. I was struck by this kind of commercials. This teenage boy is part of the idol group called TF Boys, which was super popular among the Chinese middle schoolers. The commercial was screened in the middle of the idol show, streamed online, to sell cash loans. It doesn't mention any of the obligations or risks. That a borrower has to take. Also, the advertising slogan was like this: "As long as you download the app, you can borrow money from your mobile phone." Perhaps this commercial touched my communication scholar's nerve. I felt something was wrong. FinTech is very capable and has enabled business innovation, reshaped the industry structure, and also renewed our everyday life. In the meantime, the unconstrained application of fintech in lending businesses had made debt available for those who don't quite understand debt, 
not to mention to afford the cost or risks involved. The velocity of fintech development had far exceeded the regulator's anticipation. The existing regulations, which look after traditional banking industries, can hardly rein in the tech-driven financial business. What would happen? The concerns urged me to ponder over the paradox of innovation and regulation. In 2018, I started a research project on the role of digital technology in reshaping financial regulation in China. On the one hand, as the government had expected, digital technology enables financial innovation and enlarges the financial market. On the other hand, digital technology challenged the regulatory systems since it amplifies the unintended consequences of tech-driven financial innovation. Digital technology enhanced the information symmetry of the borrowers and lenders, but that only works when the information provided by both parties are true. In reality, that doesn't happen all the time. The misinformation provided by unethical borrowers or lenders will lead to financial fraud of various kinds. For example, Izubao, the peer-to-peer -peer lending scheme, claimed that they match the lenders and the borrowers via the internet, and the lenders receive seven times higher interest than their regular deposit in saving account. In fact, they only ran a Ponzi scheme by paying the lenders with the money from the new investors or lenders. If fintech has created a new structure, there is a need to cover both the old and the new in terms of developing a more comprehensive regulatory system. My research shows that in China, an extended regulatory network has been established for larger coverage, which I call piles. Banking industry used to be a highly professional silo managed only by the central bank and the Banking Regulatory Commission. With the fintech disruption, the state council started to combine a wider range of administration to look after the financial industries, including political institutions such as National Stability Leading Group, the information administrators such as Cyberspace Administration Office, the legal department such as the Legislative Affairs Office, the Economics Institutions, such as the Development and the Reform Commission, as well as the special arrangement for unique cases that are hard to categorize. Under the coverage of piles, digital loans are slowing down, but fintech development is not. Blockchain, the main technology that makes digital transaction faster, further, and with a lower cost, becomes the next hotspot. By the end of 2020, more than 760 blockchain project, projects were registered with the Cyberspace Administration Office of China. This is a surprising number, indicating the size of the market. But I think the idea of the chain circle, or in Chinese called Lian Quan, is even more fascinating. In 2021, I started a research project to study the interactions between investors, government, research firms, and media in the chain circle. In this field, the actors compete and collaborate with each other to accumulate, exchange, and monopolize different kinds of power resources and capitals. Again, Blocks and the chains are mighty, but I feel the power relations among this group of actors are way more interesting. It is a mutual reliance of this group of actors in this system that drives the blockchain development in China. This is my maiden voyage in studying fintech. My interest in the human side of payment technologies founded my interdisciplinary research. I was amazed by the variety and the capabilities of technology and stunned by how it has changed our life. But to really understand fintech innovation, 
I need to be in touch with the people and the culture that make it happen. As a highly professional domain, fintech may sound abstruse, especially when it is veiled by jargons. Yet, fintech's everyday applications are incredibly accessible and human-oriented. For my next step, I want to study the Chinese fintech users and how they interact with other important actors in the domain, including the app designers, marketers, and the regulators. To me, the collective of these amazing humans are the momentum of fintech. Thank you.